if I have just one alien abduction movie to recommend to you this year, I guess it's going to be No One Will Save You. Yeah, we're talking about this wacky movie on Hulu called No One Will Save You. I am the man you may know as Z from Our Reviews Will Kill You, and I am here to tell you, or at least try to explain, the ending of this crazy, crazy movie that you may have watched. I, It's a little crazy, for sure. This movie goes hard in the paint as far as alien abduction movies go. Normally, they're a little bit of a slow burn like Fire in the Sky or um, Encounters the Third Kind. I mean, even uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, there's a little bit of that in there, and that goes a lot slower than this. So I'm going... There's going to be heavy spoilers for a couple of movies here. So just so you're aware, we're going to get through this. This is uh, a movie written and directed by Brian Duffield, who you may know from such movies as Underwater with Kristen Stewart, and we're going to tie it into that movie because I think there's a little bit you can learn about the director from both movies. And let's see where this goes. We'll start a little bit with the plot. Well, there's a character. Her name is Bryn, and she is living, I guess, her best life. It's a little unclear how old she is, but I'm going to assume she's over 21 because at one point she's drinking wine. And she's just cruising along, having a party. Maybe she's 22, maybe she's 24. Difficult to say. But clearly, she's a girl who is independent. She writes a lot of letters to her friend Maud. She likes to make her own food and hang out and make dresses. And I, I don't know what else is going on there. I don't know if she's independently wealthy. I don't know if she's doing OnlyFans. I don't know what she's doing. But it's a little weird for sure. She also has, and maybe this is like a hint to Beetlejuice, she has a recreate, and I don't know if it's a recreation of her town because there's nothing specifically linking it to the town that she lives in, but there's like a recreation, which as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's Beetlejuice, but I thought that was cool, and I, I thought this movie was a lot of fun, and it, like I said, it goes hard in the paint. Basically, uh, she's not real liked in town. She likes to hang out by in, in cemeteries and avoid people. She's writing a letter. How she like? Oh, I vo I saw your mom and dad today. She's writing this. She's writing this letter, and then she uh, has a nice night and goes to sleep. And then she's waking up, and as you see her doing things, like th there's a lot of callbacks here. There's a lot of setups and a lot of callbacks, which is interesting for a movie that's definitely like at, by the end you're just like, what is going on here? So she goes to sleep and is awoken by a stranger. It kind of reminds me of Signs, which I think is a great movie by M. Night Shyamalan, one of his best movies of the Alien Invader, except for in this movie, normally in a movie like this, they're like hiding the alien, and this is all within the first like 15 minutes. You start to, see, they're showing you the alien, and you're like, what is going on here? Like, I thought they'd hide a little bit but there's a little trick up their sleeve. And I thought it was fairly obvious, and I'll tell you why. There was a couple hints as to what was going on here. So she sees an alien, is running around, and you're like, what is this alien doing? Why is it trying to kidnap her? What's going on? You would think an alien with a lot of technology. Like this, you would think people would have learned from the sins of the past, from science, where you're like, these are aliens that travel the stars. They have technology. They shouldn't be that stupid. <laughs> they should be able to just take people. So this kind of escalates where she's doing this cat and mouse game. She's hiding from the alien and she's about to escape when she's opening the front door and it uses this powerful telekinesis and it just blows the front door off the gate, off its hinges and smashes her in the head which are, gets her involved with a physical scuffle. Now, what I thought was interesting about this part is that the alien that can use telekinesis and can travel the stars, you would think would have a fine-tuned force-like ability to move things, not just like randomly throwing stuff all over the place. It felt clumsy to me, which was a setup for later. So as she's scuffling with this creature, she picks up one of her... Um, 
things from the town that she has. And she winds up and knocks this dude right in the noggin, takes him right out. And then, uh, you know, she's kind of like dealing with the whole breakdown. Oh my gosh, an alien, blah, 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 blah. Like my brain, I can't handle it. And forgive me if I get the the order of events wrong in this, but I, I want to make a point. She sees a trail of something leaving from the alien. I think this is when she comes back from the town. So basically, let's come back to that. We'll, we'll stick with the plot as it stands. So essentially, she can't dial 911. All the power has been cut. We know there's a spaceship of some kind. Alien running around on... But it's a gray, which is kind of cool. I thought the special effects on this were actually very good. So it's a gray alien. And you're like, this is strange. They seem kind of klutzy. So she goes into town to tell somebody. Apparently, she's completely socially inept. And she walks right some, past some police that she could have easily said something to. Everybody's giving her dirty looks. She clearly is hiding a secret. There's a problem with this young girl. So... She walks into the police station and she sees the people she was trying to duck. <clears throat> the people she was trying to duck from the... Uh, she was at a funeral. And it turns out that, uh, clearly that there's a payoff in the end. But they spit on her. Well, the mom spits on her. And there's clearly problems. She goes back and she decides she's going to leave town. Because she's like, I can't handle this. It's too crazy. And things keep escalating. She gets on the bus. And the thing has taken over the bus and you're like what is going on here right there's a thing that's taken over this uh ups or the post office driver his body and it's making weird gl -gl 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 noises and you're like wow what is going on here she gets back to the house eventually she makes a big giant circle makes it back to her house she sees there's like a a snail trail if you will out to the forest and i immediately it clicked for me earlier when I saw that the humans had been taken over, that this was a, a parasite that had taken over the bodies of the aliens and was it was, you know, controlling them. That's why they have clumsy telekinesis. That's why they're like flying is kind of a little dumb. You know, they're flying these ships the best they can, but they don't really like have a full grasp of the bodies. Perhaps even, and I'll connect this to something else. They're maldeforming the creatures, and maybe the greys aren't the best host that's possible for them, right? So then through another series of events, I guess the creatures like really want her because they figure out that she killed one of their hosts or what have you. It's not clear. Still no talking. There, there has yet to be really, I mean, there's only like a few lines here and there, not even that. And... um it's interesting. I thought it was tense. I thought it was it was very, uh, you know, for a horror movie, and it just keeps escalating. Eventually, she's in the house, and she's fighting with this, like, long-armed gray alien. Like, he's got real stubby feet, but long arms, which is kind of ridiculous. She's fighting it off and fighting it off. Then she runs into a long-armed, long-legged gray, and I think that's where I'm saying that these, the host, these these parasites are, are deforming the creatures, Maybe the Greys aren't the best host for them. They're not real good with the telekinesis. They can fly their spaceships, but they're just looking for a home, people. They're just looking to be home. So, uh, at some point, she f blows up some of these aliens. She fights with them. Uh, there's there's a bunch of different fight scenes with her, which are all very tense. I thought the one was really funny because it's, it's looking at the pictures. So, you finally uncover that the letters that she's been sending to Maud are in fact never sent and she hangs them in a room that's kind of a shrine to Maud. And the alien's looking at them and she's like ready to sneak up and stab it in the head again and it just like flicks its fingers and throws her through the wall, which I thought was, that was great. That was a great scene. So she then kills a big giant one and uh, things come to a head where she is actually captured. They forcibly place one of these parasites in her throat where she's going to be taken by them. But she figures it out. She she finally has some speaking lines. You get to see what happens. You finally understand that Maud was her childhood friend in a fit of rage as a child. She picked up a stone, which was a callback to her hitting the alien in the head. 
She hits Maud in the face or the head. It's unclear. I thought that part could have been a little more shocking and bloody. I was looking for an A24 type smash someone in the head, knock their head off type thing like hereditary. It wasn't as shocking as it could be. I feel like that was a miss there, Mr. Director. And you find out that she killed Maud. I would assume that shortly after her mom killed herself because she couldn't stand having the, her daughter be a murderer. I would assume that's how she inherited the house, et cetera, et cetera. I did not go back to look at the times. There were, I think like her, her friend died in 1992 on the gravestone. Like if you look at it, there's a timeline there that you could figure out. But let's just assume for the sake of argument that the mom just couldn't deal with having a murderer and the whole town hates her. It's, it's get it. We get it. It's a thing. So she breaks out of the spell from the alien, and she realizes when when she's in the when the alien is possessing her that like it wants to give you like this idealized life, but she struggles with it because she can't commit to real life because she's created a fantasy world upon which she lives in. Because if you know she's doing the waltz, she's doing the dance by herself. She has the little town. She has this perfect little world set up for herself except she can't interact with anybody because they all hate her. This will be important later. So as we go along, she is, uh, she rejects it. She pulls it out of her throat. It's pretty gross. The thing going in, I will say the entire movie is a little grapey for me. Just saying it out there, like it seemed like the alien was trying to forcibly do things to her. I don't really understand. I don't think that was intentional by the director. It might have been subconscious. I don't know. But felt a little uncomfortable forcing things in this girl's mouth. There's a part where she's up against the ground. And she can't move. She's being forced. Into- a little, little much force there. Just saying. Just saying. It's a little bit of force. Anyway, we continue. And she is... Uh, <clears throat> She, she pulls it out. She rejects it. Then they pull her up in the mothership. And the mothership, they understand. They like they tap into her memories. Again, maybe things are a little out of order in my brain, too. They tap into her memories. Oh, they create a clone of her because they're trying to make, like, a happier version of her that's, like, all idealized. And she looks, you know, very, you know, she's well put together. She stabs her. But then she kills that thing, too. They suck her up into the mothership. And they... They finally want to understand what's going on. Why are you rejecting this, they say. They don't actually say that, but we're going to assume they say that. Why are you rejecting us? Why can't you? You've had a taste of the paradise we want to provide. Why are you doing this? And it's like, why are they on Earth? It, it slowly starts to make sense. Maybe the Greys are not the best host for them. They need a more suitable host because you've seen they've taken over all these other people. They kick her out of the mothership, and then you get the dance sequence where she is literally living her ideal life, where you see saucers flying around, and they're, you know, they're doing this. She has given them the idea of, you know, create a fantasy. How do the people, how do the people live like this if they are retarded? You must make them understand, you must give them a fantasy. So here, the hosts, you know, the aliens are all possessing the people, and they're all happy. They're all dancing. She's living her best life again. It's all good. It's joyous. It's happy. And that's how the movie ends, folks. And it's real. And you know why it's real? Because I will show you why it's real. Let's get into what the director had to say about this. Now, here's the ending. This is done by Collider. And I don't, I'm, I'm going to, they talk a little bit about it, but I, I don't think they actually know what's going on because they're not real clear on it. Um, but the point is no one will save you except for yourself, right? And if you don't save yourself, then how can you heal trauma? And what I want to compare this to and, and this is what what this is his farcical answer to the the question. This is directly from the writer and director. I really wanted to direct a musical, and no one would let me. So jokes on them. No, I knew the ending needed to have something communal for Bryn. That and I love the character Bryn, and I know Caitlin does too. That's the actress. I thought she was great. 
And I think we both really protective of her. She's dealt with a lot of emotional stuff before the movie even started. And then we really just kick her ass up and down the whole movie. It felt like you could do, and I love A24, but you could do the real slap in the face ending with her dying or whatever and give her that hard thing. But I just liked her too much to be pouring salt on so many wounds. So I wanted her to be better off at the ending than she was at the beginning, no matter what. And I wanted her to have some sort of communal element that was such a huge part of the movie. She doesn't have a community. Like I said, no one will save you except for yourself, but you still have to forge a community together. Then it felt like, what would a community thing be? I was like, oh, she'd probably just throw a dance, but that's too crazy. Then I never thought of any other idea. So it was in the script, and I was always like, well, someone at some point is going to tell me no. Well, that never happened. And let me just contrast this, because <clears throat> he has some other answers too. But I want to contrast this to another movie that he did, which is Underwater with Kristen Stewart. Now, this is Screen Rant trying to understand the ending and basically spoiler for underwater which is another movie written and directed by this by this guy is that the end of that movie is basically everybody dies and the point is is that they're in this underwater mining facility and they've unleashed something horrible and what they what the what is hinted is that it's cthulhu from the lovecraft mythos and that, and, and this is where Screen Man kind of misses the boat, is that Cthulhu is to bring, is an old god from, he's beyond space and time, he's, he's inconceivable, the horror that he brings, and that he will bring the earth and the entire universe into darkness, a darkness unlike you've ever seen. So when he's unleashed, because he's been asleep at the bottom of the ocean, it's inconceivable what will happen. And, and Kristen Stewart's character sacrifices herself to try to destroy it, but there is no killing. What can't be killed? You can't kill this. So I think he made this movie underwater and he made a really dark movie and he made it and it was very disturbing and people didn't like that ending. So he wanted to try a slightly different ending. So you have the complete apocalyptical ending and then you have this one where it's still apocalyptical, but there's a positive spin on it where everybody is happy in the end of this. And I think that it's an interesting direction. It's bleak and dark, but leaves the director happy. And he had more to say about this. He says, for Brynn, it's not a delusion or anything. I love Brynn. I love her character. We've heard all that. And, uh, you know, she got kicked so hard and, you know, is she dead or is she dreaming? That's what he says there. But I think the material suggests everything. For Bryn as a character, it's a genuine experience that she's having it. You can interpret it as a dream, which I, I do not believe. I especially because beforehand. Uh, but I don't know how much I believe you can heal in a dream. I like bleak horror endings, but I like Bryn more than those. I think every version of the ending, there's a definite, a definite element of bleakness to it. But I think for me, it's an important part of the ending that Bryn is in a good place. He doesn't think that she, she's just decided to live with them because they understand her. At the end, no one else can, but they do. That it wasn't really her fault. And that, you know, this was an accident, but you can cope with your with trauma by living in a fantasy. And I think that's the ultimate ending that and while it's not a fantasy, but they create they feel like, oh, you don't have to have a mental fantasy because she tried that and she rejected it. But in the end, what they really want is a fantasy that you can live in that is as real as what you and I can touch. And they can do that in a sense of community because it seemed like there was a sense of community with the Greys. But again, perhaps they were mutating the Greys and they were having trouble with them, controlling them, and, and they don't, you know, they didn't feel like it was a good fit for them. So that's my ex explanation. I hope that you agree with me, maybe you disagree with me, you know. Brain appears happy as even uh, as even though the neighbors are infected with alien parasites, it makes them politer and kinder to her. It's genuinely the kind of world she longed to live in. Even she went down an unusual path to get there. 
One may find it shocking and worry about the aliens invading the rest of the world, but one must remember that this is Bryn's story and not Bryn's world story. So there's a lot of ways to interpret it, but I think we've got a grip on it. Do you disagree? Do you think it's something different? I, for myself, enjoyed this movie. I thought it was pretty good. I thought the ending, <laughs> while a little bizarre, uh, fit what we were getting here because it went so hard in the paint. I thought this was one of the more original movies that I've seen in a long time. And I actually kind of like that underwater movie too. While it's kind of a ripoff of Alien and Leviathan and some other underwater movies kind of mashed together. I think this is a, is also, it, it's a director who is trying to find his voice. He has a lot of influences. He likes M. Night Shyamalan, clearly. He likes Alien, so he likes James Cameron. So he's got a lot of people he likes, but he he's, hasn't quite crafted his own unique voice yet. But this is pretty close. And I think there's going to be more good stuff from this director. Keep your eye out. His name is Brian Duffeld, I believe. Let's uh, Brian Duffield. So keep an eye out for him. I think he's got some good stuff ahead of him. Let me know what you think in the comments below. In the meantime, we have a full-length audio podcast that you can listen to and enjoy. It we live stream it here on YouTube. It's also on Rumble, but you can hear it here, 7:30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday nights is the live stream. But you can catch it whenever you want. It's a good time. You can also hear the podcast edition of it, which is on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, all those great places and more. But as for myself, I shall explain something else in a different one because I am on to the next one. Mm -hmm.